uh, very shortly we're going to hear uh, Nicholas Kovacim. Did I get it right? Thank you. Playing Another Sea by Natalie Hunt. And I'd like to welcome Natalie up here, who's going to explain all about Another Sea. There's rather a nice story behind it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Natalie. I'm a composer. I'm from Wellington, or I live in Wellington these days. Um, I consider Ennis Clark particularly Douglas Wilburn to be my chief. Well, I do casual work on cruise ships, I do use the Canary on board, um, and so I'm quite inspired by the sea. Um, and because we're celebrating Wilburn, I wanted to write a piece that was partly inspired by Wilburn. Now, I I should probably say, I don't know Wilburn all that well. Um, I think he's fantastic, but he just never spoke to me in the same way some other composers did. Um, so you probably hear a, a stronger sense of, say, Debussy and Ravel in my works than you will of Wilburn. Um, but I tried to sort of bring Wilburn's use of um, intervals that he tended to use into his work. Um, and I sketched it probably on uh, Wilburn's piano, which is at the National Library. Um, I then finished it when I was working on board between Sydney and Vanuatu, New Caledonia um, on the cruise ship and it's called the next day. Yeah, that's lovely. I don't know if you heard that, but she started working on it on Douglas's piano, the, the one that you heard the his salute to the other night uh, played and then finished it on the sea, which I think is rather wonderful. Is it the title referring in to anything about the sea or is it just the fact that it was finished at sea? Or were you all at sea during it? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, it's also trying to allude to Wilburn's Sea Changes, which are my favourite pieces. Um. Lovely. Yes, they are nice. They, he wrote them, when he wrote them, it had nothing to do with the sea at all. He retitled them 30 years on, but they still sound like the sea, don't yeah. they? Yeah. <laughs> a, a classic case of fine, uh, writing the piece and then getting the title later, and as I said before. Okay, <laughs> without further ado, let's hear the piece. Did you like it? Um, yeah, I really enjoyed playing that piece. Okay, so what were the big challenges for you and that you think these uh, piano teachers might be interested in? Um, it's 
quite there's lots of different layers of sound involved and kind of finding ways to differentiate um, ways of sound across kind of what they mean in different ways. I think it's a very um, kind of evocative piece in terms of symmetry. And I want to kind of try to find the meaning behind kind of all the little details and all the different gestures involved. Oh, that's interesting. So it wasn't a technical challenge so much as an interpretive challenge. Oh, no, no, no technical challenge. Yeah, I, I, I thought that <laughs> might have been. But, but for you, the interpretive ones uh, was the, the interesting challenge. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it from the moment I started playing it. So, yeah. Oh, fantastic. More <laughs> ultimate compliments. Uh, how did he play it? Was he any good? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> right, comments from the floor on that one. Uh, the triplets, I think, at the bottom of page one, from memory? Uh, yeah, page one, page one, couple of Oh, and then the da 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 I knew this question was going to come up. <laughs> um, to be honest, I think the triplets at the bottom of page one, the da 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 When I played piano, which my mum will attest to, it did actually used to happen sometimes, um, I used to play the Cacciatorium Toccata, which has a lot of sort of triplet motives. I can't remember, you might know it. I've, Mum, do you want to play it? No. Okay. <laughs> um, so that, I don't know, that Cacciatorium Toccata still comes through in a lot of my pieces. Um, I didn't realise that until this morning, um, <laughs> when I, I just happened to be thinking about the Toccata and, and I felt my piece and realised that yeah, there's still a strong influence of that in there. Um, as far as the da 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 in the, in the octaves when it's blowing up on page two, um, I just wanted to build the momentum up in that one. I find triplets a good way of building up momentum. But I could hear, I could hear the one, I could hear my three times from That's page two. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's just, just again, a, a question of what you were thinking. I <laughs> love <laughs> your piece. Thank you. Um, but I wondered if sitting at Douglas's piano did actually inspire you in some ways. You do know the Douglas's um, sea changes. Mm -hmm. There seem to be so many um, elements there which could have been inspired by Douglas. For instance, the left hand octaves and yes. wave patterns and the time signature changes yes. and uh, quite a number of things. I just wondered if that really was an, an influence. And if so, I think it's a beautiful follow up. Thanks. Um, I'm really glad that that came through. I wasn't sure if it would. Um, I listened to all of Little Ben's piano works um, a few times before I sat down to write it. Sort of made notes about various things. Um, particularly took note of the sea changes in, I think, from the port hills. And also remembered things like you know, dry style aperture. Um, just the, the use of space to suggest enormous depth below and depth above and things like that. So I really want that to come through in this piece. But yeah, I'm glad that it did come across. Okay, lovely. <laughs> right, we're on to piece number five. Shortly, Sam Shute is uh, going to play Triangle Staple Staple by Carlo Magatich. Now, have I got that right? I've been practicing all morning, so I'm glad I got it right. Second try. Uh, now, Carlo told me he's uh, often struck mute when he comes in front of the general public, so we've got to give him a particularly warm welcome, but I think he was pulling my leg when he told me that, but let's wait and see how talkative he really is. Carlo, come up to us. Hi, everyone. Well, I guess I should start by explaining the title. Um, those of you that have the music in front of you will see that on the very, above the very first bar, there is a triangle and two staples. Um, these are, if, if you conduct, um, are conducting symbols for groups of three and two. Um, and if you think about it, uh, we base all our time signatures on groups of three and two, and very rarely groups of one. Um, maybe if you're playing some particularly weird piece of messian, you might come across a time signature like 164. <laughs> um, so anyway, I was conducting a piece by a friend of mine, and he had written all these very intricate groups of three and two, and all that sort of stuff, and we're having quite a bit of trouble. And he had notated all sorts of triangles and, and um, little staple things, just like in there. Um, and as we were rehearsing this piece, we came to know it as um, the triangle and staple piece 
Um, so when I came to write this um, little work, uh, one thing that's quite uh, dear to me is um, asymmetrical um, and irregular time signatures. It must be that kind of South European blood. Um, and I guess in this piece, you could say that um, it was inspired by the work of Bartok and the early piano works of Ligeti, um, for both Hungarian. It's, it's basically a rhythmic exercise in ternary form. So uh, the, the bit at the start comes back at the end, and in the <laughs> middle, I thought for a good contrast, we would um, go for a, a more mushy sort of sound. Um, so there's this very dissonant drone down in the bass, um, while unrelated major chords are sort of played over the top. Um, I think that's that's enough for me. Let's oh, that's wonderful. So we're listening for mushy sounds and a bit of spiciness, uh, yep. uh, spikiness <laughs> in the room. Excellent. You got that? Right. Let's hear it. Fantastic, both of you. Um, uh, Sam, do you need a moment to recover? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, tell us what it was like to come to grips with that. It took a while to grow used to. Um, first couple of times we were playing for it separately, it was very confusing to me, especially. I've done a couple of arrhythmic pieces before, but nothing quite to that extent where it changes all the time. And um, it did take a long time to get used to, but the more I played it, the more I enjoyed those rhythms. And I really thought, especially in that first and last section, it wasn't the notes themselves that were playing again and again in my head. It was just uh, again and again. So it was really cool. Exploring takes a really interesting rhythms like that, yeah. Oh, excellent. Uh, was it um, uh, easy to play? Uh, I, I mean, there are a lot of notes in. That would have been hard. But pianistically, how um, did you find it? It fell on the hand quite nicely. I wasn't very good at those black key Oh, they're yeah. terrible, you know, your skin, your knuckles, painful. or those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got quite soft hands, so um, they took a while to really get the technique right, and, um, but everything fell quite nicely on the hands. Okay. It was a good exercise for the fingers, actually. Oh, that's really, good. It was really nice. Carlo, do you play the piano? Badly. Have you ever tried, <laughs> have you ever tried to do a black note glissando? Oh, yeah. Play it to us now. <laughs> <Let's hear> it. <laughs> As you all know, Different pianos have different reactions. <laughs> and this is a terrible piano, you really. Really? Gosh, you must have a. Heard. 
I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> There was a piece by uh, Italian composer Salvatore Sciarino that um, New Zealand Trio recently played and uh, here in Wellington. And Sarah Watkins, their wonderful pianist, um, actually put on some um, protective covering <laughs> on, her, on her hands because the entire piano part consists of only oh. the sandy. Yes, I saw Sarah a month after that and she was still trying to recover. <laughs> Um, everybody's been so interesting. We're, we're really getting through it so quickly. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Do you think the, these good people should purchase that piano part and play it? Or is it any use to teach it? I really it? think that, as well as being a piece which is, um, you know, it's enjoyable to play, and the longer you play it, the more enjoyable it becomes. I really think it's a good exercise in rhythm, and just for that, just for getting your head around these complex rhythms and shifting between time signatures all the time, I think it's really useful for that. Oh, oh, excellent. You should employ him uh, as your publicist. <laughs> he does a good job. Right, let's hear from the uh, discerning critics. I'd just like to ask, Carla, were you influenced at all by uh, the ostinato by Bartok, the other guitar, yeah. the Cosbox? Uh, no, well, it's been a, actually a very long time since I, I've played through the Mitokosmos pieces. Um, but that sort of thing is quite under my skin as a composer especially when thinking about rhythm. Okay. Well, look, that's a very good question for us to quickly segue and um, put our five wonderful composers on these five wonderful bar stools and fire as many questions as we can in a few minutes flat. I would just like to ask, um, the, if uh, someone wanted to use them in competitions, like in Auckland, um, do you have copyright on them or what? Uh, Carlo, you'd probably speak to that one. Well, pr provided that you own a, an original copy of the book, there's absolutely no problem playing the piece in public at all. Right, so a student could play one of the pieces in a competition? Yep, as long as they're in possession of an original copy. So you wouldn't have to pay um, copyright to your book? No. No, the, the thing is, um, most composers, and I can't say all, because it's a voluntary join up an organisation called Australasian Performing Rights Association. And in joining them, uh, which is absolutely free membership if you want to join an organisation just for the sheer hell of joining one, um, they then take control of uh, all your rights and uh, they assign the rights out to uh, uh, various venues mainly rather than actual organisations. So. So uh, that is covered under the general APRA licensing. But what we poor, hungry, starving composers really like you to do is actually notify APRA when you have a performance. It won't cost you anything, but it will get us $3.20 in our next paycheck, <laughs> if we're lucky. <laughs> uh, another question. Yes. Have you got a big voice? I was wondering whether these people were good students uh, when they first learned music, or whether they were always doing something else <laughs> instead of what the teacher had asked. I would be curious to know if any of you fitted into that category. I fit into that category very much. You have bad students, so let's hear. What have we got? Now, you've already said something. How are you today? Um, well, my first music teacher is in Scotland, and I haven't seen her since I was nine. Um, as for violin, I think I was pretty good. Um, okay, my mother's telling me I was. Um, <laughs> yes, she said too what she was supposed to be doing. Not always at the time when you studied. <laughs> <laughs> As for piano, I think one of the main problems being that I was a violinist, I had a very understanding teacher who gave me the sorts of pieces that she knew I would play. <laughs> um, but I did, I composed more at the piano. So speaking for myself, um, that probably held me back as a pianist. Um, that's where it's good to have more than one instrument. I don't compose at the violin. But no, so um, I guess that's a no. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you want to go for it? Uh, I'm a trombonist, and uh, I probably worked equally hard at composition and trombone through high school. And then when I went to university, I did a major in composition. So the trombone playing definitely took a back seat. Uh, yeah. But, uh, I compose, I, sometimes at the piano, yeah, yeah. 
Speak up as loudly as you can. I think there's a time so short we can't yeah. hear the microphone around. Did you have an experience you'd like to relate to us? Oh, I was I was a bit scared too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but because my uh, my <laughs> sorry, I put bad vibes out. But um, my um, because my family were folk musicians. That kind of thing. I was always jamming around with different people. So I got the experience of just spending hours and hours. Even if you made mistakes, it didn't matter. So I got the whole experience, and that helped a lot. Um, Can I hop in there? Because I really love it when teachers encourage a certain amount of improvisation. Because the improvisation I've done has saved my backside in my final master's recital, not master's, uh, honors recital. Believe it or not, I didn't improvise, but the ability to think on your feet is not always emphasized. And I think it's really useful. So th thanks for bringing that up because I really love it when teachers do that. Yes, it's, it's a very good point. The first thing you've got to know how to do as an orchestral violinist is fake it. Um, <laughs> 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 Actual <laughs> improvisation, thank you. Something to say about that voice? I'm a terrible student. <laughs> don't, don't teach me. I'm always doing my own thing. <laughs> yeah, we should start a club in that, really. It's uh, called the individual. Most creators are terrible students. Yeah. They really are. You know. Either that or we have terrible teachers. I don't know. Yes, we have a, a question over there. Um, I've, I've actually been quite awestruck by sitting in this room with five wonderful people and five brilliant people. I'd like to ask, thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you is not good enough, but thank you. Yes, that, that, like that is really good. You know, <laughs> I think a round of applause for that. Okay, look, uh, I'll just leap in there and say we've probably got a minute divided by five <laughs> people, six seconds each, if my math is correct. Go something. for it, Simon. Yes. What we've seen up here is that most of us have had backgrounds in various styles of performance, so improvisation, jazz, folk music, I've done a bit of all sorts. And I think that that is certainly for me a massively important part of the impulse to create something new is when we've had experiences of different kinds of music making and I know that it's easy to stay in one style of performance <coughs> because I know how hard it is when I try a new one but I also know how much fun it is and so I think there's also a certain um, amount of example that can come from a teacher who is happy to just you know break out some fiddle tunes or make something up off the spot because I saw it in the classrooms as well. Teachers who didn't want to put themselves forward to a certain degree often unfortunately pass that on to the students. So yes, if that's, I'd say that um, 
that's my response is that the willingness to play in different styles and to introduce a world of music that if a teacher, even if a teacher doesn't compose, if they have a view to introducing lots of music of different kinds, I think that will help the impulse. And I wouldn't ask any more of piano teachers or instrumental teachers. Would you like to answer that? Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the IMMP on behalf of all of us. Um, it's actually paying us to write music. It's not going to be nice to pay us as well. <laughs> 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 it did help us write these pieces. It supports us hard, so I know we work in our day jobs or whatever, and actually spends time composing, and that's made a huge difference. So thank you um, for supporting us in that way. Excellent. Well spoken. And a final word from the three that haven't answered that question? Answer that question. Um, exposure to all sorts of things and just general enthusiasm from the teacher I think is the most important thing. Yeah, I agree. And uh, to add something specific to that, I think playing in an orchestra is a great way to learn how to write for orchestra. Uh, it's a lot more interesting than reading a textbook. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so I think a lot of your piano students, if they don't play an orchestral instrument, it would be a great thing for them to do. Um, but the flip side of that is I was an orchestral musician who didn't really play the piano or didn't learn it formally and I, I sort of taught myself um, by, through composing, through just fiddling around and uh, I thought maybe something I'd say to you is if you know of anybody like that, so an orchestral musician or just any kid who loves just sort of teaching themselves and is, is clearly a creative person who's into it, uh, do encourage them to actually get lessons as well. Uh, so, because I wish somebody had forced me and said, you know, learn the piano properly. Uh, it's a bit late now. <laughs> Maybe not. But, um, yeah. So do, do, do find those people and, and I think if you can be both creative and have a really good training, that's a, a wonderful thing. Not only in, in uh, piano playing, but in compositional technique as well. Yeah. Thanks. So, so just one, one very quick thing. I think pretty much everything's been covered there. Just one thing for those very competitive students out there, which I was one, um, when I was doing composing, there were um, competitions for like a, a new Plymouth competition where I was from. They, they had um, categories for composers, and it was great to be able to enter um, competitions where you could win money to write songs. So if, if there are any competitions out there for that, and you want us to know wherever you are, um, that's a great thing as well. So if they can win stuff, <laughs> they love it. <laughs> that's fact, <laughs> generation Z. On behalf of us all here now, and indeed pianists, teachers and listeners of the future, thank you all so much for this very unique event, the launch of High Five and the insight into your gen the, its genesis. So, Carlo, thank you. You have provided New Zealand and indeed the world with new music. We applaud your musical creativity, your musical wit and your craftsmanship. Thank you for cooperating so readily and so ably with our requests throughout this project. You've been a pleasure to work with. And pianists, as Michael said, that's silent, the book's silent. We needed you to turn the notes into musical reality. So indeed, I think, I, I truly believe you've sold it to people today. So thank you once again. We need to thank the Stout Trust for the very generous grant to pursue this unique project. And to Sean Williamson for her amazing expert um, request for our sponsorship. Thanks to Sounds and to Julie Spearing in particular for your enthusiastic support from the outset and for ensuring that this event and th this music will be available well into the future.
look at these beautiful books. We're so proud of the look of them, not just the sound of what's in them. And so we just want to congratulate and thank Simon and um, Claire so much for this beautiful format and also for Alistair Gilkerson, who was the editor of Typesetter. Of course, what a huge thanks yet again to Philip for making this such a, a completely satisfying and entertaining and wonderful event. Thank you. Finally, we must say, well done, Barbara. <laughs> the idea that this conference should be the catalyst for a creative project. You've given it your full attention, have been a pleasure to work with, and can be truly satisfied. High fives all round, though. <laughs>